Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Before we get started, just two pieces of housekeeping. Just another reminder that if you've yet to sign up for my newsletter at jasonperera.ca, please do so. I see several of you doing it, but not all of you. So please get on it. And on to my second piece of housekeeping, the 2020 IFED conference, that is the Individual Finance and Insurance Decision Center conference, of which I am on the board of, is happening on April 7th, 2020 in Burlington, Ontario. If you're in the area, please take the time to come out and listen to three speakers on the topic of the value of financial advice. Tickets are free and you can find them and more information at ifidconference, I-F-I-D conference.com. Now, on today's show. Today on the show, I have Jay Haynes, CEO of eCentire. eCentire is a security company that provides digital security services for mid-level companies, specifically in the finance space. And here's my interview with Jay. Hello, Jay. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you for coming in today. Happy to be here. So, Jay Haynes, President and CEO of eCentire. Tell us about eCentire. Well, eCentire is an interesting story. It's uh, somewhat disrupting uh, uh, the way security has been delivered in the mm-hmm. past. We set out years ago to solve a problem that was really a uh, customer ask. They said, mm-hmm. can you help us with this particular problem? And and we didn't know you couldn't do it this way and ended up creating a new category in cybersecurity. Okay. We're going to get into what that new category is. But before we get there, so you actually went, went into the history. Talk about your history before you came to it and what led to that entire development of eCentire. Yeah, so my background, um, I, uh, I'm a, what they call a serial entrepreneur, which uh, some might argue uh, should have a sentence that goes with it, but um, <laughs> this is about my sixth or uh, seventh company since... Uh, Padded room sentence? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Since university, I started my uh, first company when I was uh, doing my master's in engineering at University of Guelph in uh, what's uh, called SCADA, or now the Industrial Internet of Things, because they had mm-hmm. to rename it. My background had always been technical, and I started uh, the first business back then, which I ended up venture funding and selling to Enbridge, uh, uh, which was an interesting journey right out of school. And then um, another of other companies along the way, including uh, Europe, you know, working with uh, European uh, shareholders, which mm-hmm. uh, was, was also an experience. Uh, they do things quite differently over there in the tech community than they do here. I mm-hmm. uh, did a tour of duty in engineering software uh, 20 odd years later. And then uh, from that company, I, uh, I joined into eCentire. And I also had a, another stop in uh, healthcare software, a very challenging industry that uh, there's not a technical problem to, to that we can't solve there. It's more of a political one. It's quite I was going to say, hello, yeah. barriers to entry when they come to when it comes to regulation. Yeah. So you just really don't like working for anyone else. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So you teased us with or, or you, unemployable. Un- well, this is the thing about yeah. all entrepreneurs; they become highly unemployable after a while. So basically, you teased us with this new category of of security. Tell us what you meant by that. Well, the background of the industry, um, and this is still largely how it works today, is you have a lot of uh, firms, there's, um, you know, somewhere in the 2500 uh, range right now. Um, mm-hmm. It shrunk a lot uh, when there was a lot of consolidation in the mid 2000s. The McAfee's and Symantec's bought up a bunch, but the problem keeps changing. So a bunch of new uh, solutions come to market. So, so these uh, firms are typically building a business plan, solving one of the many problems uh, today in the enterprise uh, world, uh, CISOs are dealing with 70 or up to 70 different security technology categories, which is 70. Yeah, seven zero. Um, oh, good Lord. It's certainly no fewer than 50. And that's at the enterprise space. And they are probably a 10 year uh, lead on the mid market. And the mid market is still trying to figure this out. And, and the mid market are, are critical suppliers in many cases to the enterprise. So so what has happened is the, the motion is, uh, Build a plan, get it funded, try and get you know a bunch of enterprise accounts and get to thirty or forty million as a, in a single category, and then then you have exit opportunities. That's that's mm-hmm. sort of a, a venture cycle. I got this uh, repeated to me countless times as I was funding the business, growing it, where they would say, "You guys are so different. You don't actually have any enterprise customers. You're all mm-hmm. selling to mid market. Your biggest customer is less than one percent of your revenue." It was quite you know uh, refreshing for the venture yeah, investors. The entire like, how long yeah. are secure are these contracts? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a SaaS. We can get into that a little bit later, yeah. but um, so they, that sort of clued me into. Uh, Okay, why is it that way? And, and the reason it is that way is fundamentally at the enterprise level, the chief information security officer or CIO slash CTO organizations are the solution uh, providers. They've got a very specific view on their business and a context, and they know all the different problems that need to be solved. And it's vast and it's complex, and they have small armies of people. If you look at a company like Goldman Sachs, they'd have 10,000 people in IT. There's probably 10% of them, mm-hmm. uh, plus or minus, that are in some security-related function. So that's larger than most security companies on the planet. Just to <laughs> give you perspective. 
So you go all the way down to the mid-market firms, and we characterize you know, our, our sort of our lane is between 200 and 2,000 being the sweet spot, but we have customers with 10, 20 employees and others with 40,000 employees. But the range is 200 to 2,000. So that so that we would characterize as a mid-size enterprise or, or SME. There's lots of different ways of characterizing it. In that segment of the market, they still have the same problem. They still are, you know, they have um, attackable assets. Yes. And the adversary is really, uh, uh, it's like it's, which one is easiest? to attack this week and, uh, and 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 if you don't have your defenses up uh, at the level of like a Citibank or, or a JPMC uh, Royal Bank in Canada you would see you would see great success so so this is the problem that, and these people don't even have a lot of times uh, chief security officers but they have it, it makes total sense right yeah. I mean at that scale you've, you've achieved enough scale that you can afford the full-time staff to do that not only that you're typically especially in you know banking or something like that, yeah. you are in a highly sensitive honeypot of an industry that people yeah. are going to want to attack every which way possible. So you have to commit yourself at top level at the top level of that. Whereas if you're small to mid-market, you're typically not necessarily the infrastructure provider to start off, like you may be using a custodian to handle the money side of it, and therefore you know, you're know you relying on their technology predominantly just to keep things secure. But then there's that mid piece where you're transitioning from the outsource provider to the in-source provider. That's gotta be a real challenge for people to kind of stay secure in. Yeah, in, in financial services, I mean, you were getting very close to the origins of the business here. Yeah. Uh, we decided to take on the easy problem of securing hedge funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the buy side is like the wild west. And, you know anything that looks like a drag coefficient on uh, getting a, a transaction done or a particular strategy executed. You cut me one millionth of a percentage of a of a, of a second, not a yeah, chance. Yeah, yeah, it goes out the window. So you, what you have to do is is um, is understand um, what their their uh, problem from the executive level there. And and from there, so where I'm going with this is the CISO is the solution provider in the enterprise and they figure out which of these 70 technologies they need. The mid-market doesn't even know what the question is. And uh, and so they need an outside party to come in. So we we approach security instead of a set of features as uh, uh, solving the threat problem for them. So we have very specifically, we will be your threat management partner. We will stand up a business that, that is basically an extension of your organization. We will make decisions as though we were one of your employees mm -hmm. and we will actually block traffic and we will shut down servers. And then we will tell you what we were just able to stop. And this so happens. you're managing this on their behalf. Exactly. So you're an outsource, basically CISO in a lot of ways. Exactly. But a, a whole security operations center to get you know the, the full extent of it. So you know in terms of those 70 technologies, we have competence of our own stack in somewhere around 20 of them, the 20 most critical ones. If you look at the mid market, they are still dealing in the top 10. They don't even get down to you know there's some nice stuff in 40 or 50 all the new you know AI based capabilities. They're yeah. still just basically trying to get the doors locked and you know and, and get the window latched. <laughs> on and, and have motion sensors and have that work consistently. So it's very hard for them because they have, take a hedge fund, they got 10 billion of assets under management. They're doing hundreds to low thousands of trades a day. They've got four people in infrastructure technology. They might have a few people in the uh, investment officer's office writing algorithms, but for the most part, they don't have anybody doing security. To monitor 24-7, you need a team of minimum of 10. Mm -hmm. So you see the problem here. You've got, like, you just yeah. you don't have the resources to be able to do what the big guys do, yet they still have the same problem, they have the yeah. same exposure. And, and it makes sense. Their mindset is that they're every all resources are towards generation revenue. End of story. Right? Exactly. So they're, they they see another IT person there. I can't even I can't just imagine. They hired someone to run the security and be like, hey, can you run this? Like, we're running a short, short on bodies. Can you run an algorithm to do whatever? Yeah. Like, I can see that very quickly getting reappropriated just because yeah. that's... That's the way they are. That's their mindset. So you're managing this stuff. This this stuff. Are you, are you putting people on? I'm taking it. It's remote. You're not putting people on premise. Yeah, that was part of the problem. Um, the constraints that were uh, given to us. I, the reason I want to spend a bit of time on the hedge yeah, funds is because yeah. solving that problem for that market actually opened it. Like they were. That was five years ahead of the rest of the world in terms of mid market. So the main buying reason for them before any of the regulation came in out of the SEC, which wasn't, which is more like guidelines than regulation, but before any of that happened, it was really they wanted to protect their reputation. They're also known as liquid alts. And um, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen redemption cycles of you know 90 or 120 days. And you know, they make their money on 2% and 20, the way that all of the yep. uh, asset managers do um, in one form or another. And um, if they, you know, if they could get hundreds of millions redeemed on a drop of a hat, basically, you know, you can't you can't stand a business up in Manhattan on low hundreds. They gotta be starting with a B kind of yeah. thing. So so they want to protect that. Plus they can't put it to work if they don't have it. So we very much were charged with uh, protecting the reputation. They didn't want to be the hedge fund that had the strategy that was identical to the, the one down the street that had sloppy security. So that money just lifted and, and went down the street.
Yeah, and you would think, I, I almost feel like in that space, there's far less forgiveness, right? I mean, if I was to imagine a major Canadian bank getting hacked or whatever, it might be American bank getting hacked and there's a release of information, which, you know, it's, to be honest, it's happened specifically in the credit card issuers and whatever else. It's, I feel like they take a reputational hit but not a almost career business ending one that I think the hedge funds would be exposed to. Yeah, so exactly the terms I use. A business altering breach could be somewhere between career and company ending. That's, the that's one of my right? lines actually. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean it's it's something that should be frightening, it should be keeping them up at night and being a priority. I mean, security is, is an ever present need in this industry. And interestingly enough yeah. today, I just recorded from my other podcast, an interview with a uh, specialist in cybersecurity. So we've had this conversation mm-hmm. at great length. Mm-hmm. So tell me about how you actually deploy this Solution. I mean, so besides making sure that your solutions do not get in the way of the microseconds that they need to transact, what is it you're doing for them? How are you implementing? So the, the technology stack has evolved, but in today's day and age, a lot of encryption and so forth, um, what we do is we, uh, we have a, a sensor, which is a super high capacity uh, server that uh, records all the traffic going in and out of their network, as well as some of the internal segments of the network. And that's sort of like a, a DVR, if you want to think about it like mm-hmm. that. Now, this is a method, it's called full packet capture, but um, um, but think of it as the ability for an analyst who gets a signal that something weird might have been going on to be able to rewind the tape, rewind the tape, and replay uh, the crime scene happening. Mm-hmm. And that crime scene is electronic, and, and from there we can harvest the details of the threat that's come in. We then isolate those and move them into a contained area, and then call it detonated. But there's a lot of Hollywood in this industry. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, pull all of the what we call indicators of compromise. See what the uh, the tradecraft was up to, and from there, that's that's how you actually develop threat intelligence. And as soon as you gather that and you and you can make a, a, an assertion that this is a systematic threat, then we can take those indicators and push it out to all of our subscribers. It's like a crowdsourcing model. And then we immediately, as soon as we see it, we block it before it even gets in. So you crowdsource the entire threat, uh, threat assessment situation. So if any yeah. one of your clients basically has this one of these threats, someone starts sniffing around a certain way you haven't seen before, you quickly isolate it, identify it, basically figure out what the playbook is for it, yeah. and, and systematically shut it down across the entire network. That's right. And now the, now the one most at risk is going to be that, that uh, the first, customer. Yeah, the first tip. So the, it's, it's the zero on, day is yeah. in trouble. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. immediately onto their, um, onto their network and then everybody else. But usually within, within an hour around the world. So uh, we're in 3,000 data centers, uh, 700 customers, which give you a rough idea. Mm-hmm. Securing uh, over $6 trillion of combined AUM, which causes us to pinch ourselves every once in a while because you've got a fairly high uh, responsibility. We are the primary security organizations for those customers, not uh, sort of the back. It's interesting. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you think about the the larger case providers, like you said, right? I mean, God forbid there's a threat assessment that comes in and and one client basically leaves because they're so angry with them, right? That can Mm -hmm. really devastate that company because you're dealing in the mid-market. That risk of customer loss is smaller. So you catch it, you do it, but that person, you know, that company is still like, oh, you didn't catch this before it even Mm -hmm. happened. You weren't weren't a precognitive, you know, protection. So we're getting rid of you. Well, okay, go ahead and get rid of us. But now we managed to at least, you you, you left, but we we saved everybody else, right? So from a business standpoint, it's a lot more sustainable, quite honestly. Yeah, we don't have the high concentration risk, yeah. and, and you know, let's, it is a very competitive uh, market. So we have, yeah. um, we are a premium service. We probably cost thirty percent higher than the next closest, uh, but we actually do quite a bit more. And yeah. and so, um, if we come back to what I talked about creating this new category, we had a bunch of different names for it. But what it's uh, known as now is managed detection response. There's a big analyst firm uh, you may have heard of, Gartner Research. Yep. They came up with this whole classification of security technologies and they have you know, one category is called protective technologies another one is predictive technologies and then detection uh, technologies and response technologies and what they would basically say even including the enterprise is that well they may be a little over indexed on protective and predictive they are way under indexed on detection and response and the reason for this is not That's because yeah, <laughs> yeah. well no the reason for this is yeah. because um, the notion of relying exclusively on protective controls as a hundred percent solution yeah. Yeah. is naive and uh, they will fail so you have to get competent at detecting when they fail yeah. and uh, be able to uh, react to that in a timely fashion if you can't do it yourself yeah. get a service provider that's the M. It's putting so, other soldiers on the walls as opposed to keeping some back in some case someone breaches the yeah, wall yeah. yeah 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 so that's so that's really uh, and, and we created the category we argued with these guys let me uh, <laughs> clear on that for five years like we threw chairs at each other in our analyst briefings because they just didn't get it they wanted to call us a basically uh, an MSSP or 
or something, you know, sort of outsourcer kind of model that you think of sweatshops in faraway places. That was not what we were. So, so then all of a sudden they, they became the smartest analysts in the world and came to their senses in uh, 2016. So there was we'll 10. Just write down what you've yeah. been telling us the entire yeah. time. That's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> there was 10 companies in the first year. This year, there's over 100 that claim to have these capabilities. So we are in the lead. We're the largest pure play doing this. Yeah. And and we are uh, getting chased by 100 and it's uh, you know it's it's, it's good uh, but uh, it keeps us on our toes for you sure you also have a network effect right i mean the more companies you have the more potential attack surface the attack surface of your entire network right and then yeah. you know if any one of them gets attacked and you detect and basically are able to push that out you know yeah. there's there's definitive safety in numbers here right yeah there's another uh, you know and it's interesting because um, people look at it as binary the breach is not binary our definition of success is preventing business altering breaches yes typically what we see yeah. Is already bypassed all of your controls, right? And so they're already in, and it's a question of can they achieve their objectives. Yeah. So um, you know, I'm not going to try and make an expert on uh, cybersecurity in in this uh, short uh, discussion, but think in terms of an adversary needs to do somewhere between 15 and 20 actions in order for them to achieve their objectives. So we have to catch them and stop them sometime before they hit the last one. You never yeah. know what the last one's going to be, but uh, you know, the name of the game is early detection and containment. Yeah. So dwell time is what we aim to minimize. So we often will um, we will get one two three compromised uh, systems uh, we shut them down contain them business carries on the most we've had we're dealing with the nation state uh, from oh you know it's not not a favorite of let's say our friends south of the border um, that narrows and, it down yeah <laughs> and um, and um, you know they were uh, they're after uh, a very specific individual who was speaking nasty things about their government mm -hmm. and um, you know billionaire uh, trying to get land immigrant status in the US so we had 30 or 40 attackers simultaneously coming at us oh, usually yeah. we're dealing with one at a time but that's yeah. you know, that's an extreme case so yeah. that's what we're all about it's um, to give you some sort of idea of speed and reaction. When we detect a, a threat coming in, uh, within 45 to 60 seconds, we have eyes on glass and on average uh, have completed the investigation in under 10 minutes. So, so that's, you know, time is of the essence. And it's self-serving for us, but it's also exactly what the customer wants us to do because that minimizes the risk exposure. For us, um, it's self-serving because the sooner that we can contain it, the lower the chances are that we're going to have it spread to one, three, ten systems because mm -hmm. as a SaaS company, yeah. a software as a service company, we have a fixed price contract. And so the more people hours we have to spend on mitigating it, the less profitable the less that client is. Exactly. And yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I guess I'll go back to the entire story. I mean, you know, the men on the walls versus, you know, holding them back. You're, they got, they breached the walls, but they haven't breached the the keep, right? Like you're basically, it makes sense. They're not just, just because you get in doesn't mean suddenly the entire database got downloaded. Yeah. You're looking for specific things. You're looking to change certain things. You're looking to to modify certain things, right? Any mm -hmm. number of things. And it's, uh, or, or potentially like we discussed earlier on this other podcast, it's, uh, uh, ransomware the entire place and encrypt everything, right? So as long as you can stop them with some of those actions, mm -hmm. congratulations, you breached, you came away with nothing. Yeah. The ransomware is an interesting uh, case uh, because a couple of years ago it was very, it was very uh, smash and grab, um, and they would, you know, they'd encrypt and demand a ransom, and typically targeting, you know, consumer level individuals. Mm -hmm. Now they're much more studied. They acquire a lot of G two on the site. They have been in for a while before these larger ransoms are being yeah. demanded, and there's a good probability they've exfiltered all of the uh, data. Data that like in you know certain recent uh, breaches where they demand a ransom to get the data back. Oh, it's troubling. Yeah. And, you know, this, you know those enterprise. I mean, there's been a number. I've seen like hospitals seem to be the honeypot for this sort of thing because yeah. they typically do not have up to date software and everything because either they can't. That they don't have the budget for it, or they can't because it would not make it possible to run certain equipment. So you get yeah. lots of uh, lots of holes there. So yeah, that's a, that's a troubling one. So tell me, you know, tell us. So we know what you do, and you seem to be doing a very good job of it. Tell me about the different types of threats you're seeing your clients face. What's what's on the rise? What's happening? What's the commonalities these days? And what's the prevalence of this? Like how frequently is this happening? Are you seeing um, these well, I can you know talk to our data. We do. Um, we see somewhere in the seven to ten million raw events every day. Um, these are seven after to 10 million yeah. raw events every day. And we're using, um, we've, I can go into some details, but we've actually, uh, we acquired a, a leading AI company out of Seattle. We were in the headquarters in Toronto area here mm -hmm. of, of big data and, and artificial touch. We couldn't build the team fast enough because there's such demand. So we actually bought a whole company um, called Versive out of, mm -hmm. uh, out of Seattle. And they brought the capabilities to us to, to, you know, apply analytics at a scale that we just, uh, that we knew we needed to do. So the numbers are for every, uh, um, 1,000 raw 
events. We're using analytics, AI, and a bunch of other capabilities uh, to narrow that down to one that has to be investigated by a human. Of that one that's investigated by a human, or sorry, for every 12 that are investigated by a human, there's about eight or nine of those that are all related to the same threat with uh, different yeah. signaling because they don't come with calling cards, so you don't yeah. know exactly. No, you get some false positives in there as well, but uh, we have to keep the falses at a certain level to maintain efficacy. So then you would have, you know, of the order of 800, let's say, uh, or 400 to 800 in any given day, we're alerting a customer. So these are, these are valid threats. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 of those are like live hand-to-hand -hand combat we're dealing with an adversary. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's across those customers um, that aren't all hedge funds. I mean, that's probably a little over half of the 700 are in that uh, segment. Uh, a bunch of other financial services, legal services, healthcare, manufacturing, mm -hmm. engineering and architecture, uh, management consulting. A lot of um, sort of service provider organizations seem to be you know, it's, it's known to the adversaries as a nexus of proprietary information. Mm -hmm. and, and typically in the mid-market, it's somebody that's not got the controls in place to uh, prevent the uh, entire uh, network being encrypted. So they get targeted a lot. Wow. The day that uh, the president was announcing the executive order uh, on technology companies dealing with China, if you recall, yeah. last fall, that exact day we had a 5G supplier under attack and we were able to you know, attribute it to... Chinese one to go on. Yeah, maybe it was. And we had to convince their their uh, senior exec that to, to escalate this and bring in law enforcement because it was at it was at that that level right and, wow. and you know we were defending them but uh, it was a, a systematic uh, thing so so these sorts of things do happen and we have you know we have a, a shared view with uh, a lot of the intel community on on the adversary and you know with with what you hear um, we um, you know we have a lot of threat intelligence uh, partnerships with uh, in, uh, for instance in Canada our signals agency CSE we have a feed from them we mm -hmm. have commercial feeds some of the biggest companies in the industry, half of the threat intelligence that we are uh, putting into action on every single every single day is unique to what we've discovered in our networks. Which So 50% of everything you see is unique to something to our network. First so, time you've seen it. That's right. It, like, But we're, we were paying big subscriptions, like FSISAC. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. No. So this is the largest threat sharing organization in the world, uh, Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center. They've got somewhere north of 5,000 members, all the big banks, everybody's in it, and they're sharing threats um, it's sort of like mm -hmm. uh, you know one of us gets hurt all of us gets hurt and so that's what the whole notion yeah. of it is as one example and then our, our signals agencies and, and so forth but the point being that even with all of these feeds, which we're paying tens of thousands a, a month for, it's still latent to the actual live threat. It's latent by five or seven days. And the bad guys have access to all the same stuff. So they, as soon as they see their okay. uh, indicators uh, being shared, then they pivot off of them and come up with new ones. So it's very, like it's, when I started in this, uh, you know, 10 years ago, these were measured in, you know, somewhere in the six week range or four to six week range. Mm -hmm. Then it was, then it was, you know, 10 to 20 days. Now it's you know five to seven. I know where this movie ends. It's it's minutes and seconds. Yeah, and, and so that's what scares us is can we be fast enough on our on our threat uh, detection? That these guys are going to basically yeah. pivot literally the minute they get the yeah. second they get caught. That's uh, as well, long as they have humans in it, then they have the same. That's they the, have same the same limitations. As us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, artificial intelligence is going to push that. You know, that's, yeah. that's the reality of it. Ooh, that is a lot. No, those numbers are staggering. Quite honestly, so. Ooh, uh, what else should I know about what it is you people are well, doing? Because right now I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the size of the threat. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so there's really, um, you know, we always like to characterize it. Uh, well, the, first you look at means, motive, and opportunity, which is yep. the way the FBI started studying crime back when it was created. That still applies here. So you've got uh, opportunistic uh, criminals that are very much sm the smash and grab guys. If they can establish a beachhead, they can actually sell that um, they can sell it for you know outright or they can sell uh, as a percentage of the of the proceeds mm -hmm. and somebody you know they get into a law firm and they don't know what to do in a law firm but they can find someone on the dark web that does yeah. and all of a sudden they're instant partners with or, nice or drop law. at the wikileaks because you know it was a law firm out of Panama, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's, former law firm. He has <laughs> former law firm. Good movie yeah. about that. I watched it the other day. So yeah. you've got um, this whole idea of you know, what they're after and the ability to get at it. So the tools and the methods that used to be fairly uh, scarce and uh, somewhat uh, secretive are widely shared. Just the yeah. same way as Linux is open source operating system, there's open source uh, bad guy tools. Yeah. To the point where nation states now can have 
equal effectiveness using open source tools that regular cyber criminals are Versus using. Versus the stuff they used to develop in house from their own security. That's uh, right. Security. And so, and a lot of that's a lot of that stuff has come from stolen. Uh, like the Iranians lost some. The NSA lost seventy five percent. Yep. So all of those tools are. If you remember WannaCry. Yep. That was uh, that came out of a um, the NSA uh, tool set. Uh, oh the no, yeah, SMB. I remember that. The, I mean, honestly, yeah. we're we're having this conversation at an interesting time because the attorney general just filed against just basically starting to complain that Apple's not turning over key they want them to help uh, that shooter yeah. uh, phone get unlocked and Apple's like again we can't just make a back door for good guys like yeah. this is not possible look you, the NSA let all this stuff leak are you kidding me right yeah. so oh it's uh yeah. So, um, and, and then you know, if you if you hit the fast forward button, what we should be worried about is everything that's been stolen, that's encrypted, and no one has spent the time to decrypt it because that's very expensive compute time, not yeah. impossible, but you got to have a lot of patience. All of that stuff with um, with quantum machines can it can basically it crack, crack it in on heartbeat. demand. So there will be a period of time where all the secrets that uh, you know historical latent secrets will all become. So all the uh, stuff that's yeah. in there with with it still locked in boxes. Yeah. Those boxes are going to get cracked open once quantum becomes proliferated, yeah. and then, then it becomes an arms race on the, on the quantum side. Yeah. So the good news is that will probably start with nation states. It'll be fairly isolated. The bad news is it'll start with nation states. <laughs> so we don't need to worry about our consumer <laughs> reputations as yeah. much as, uh, or our company reputations or consumer data as much as, uh, you know, state secrets. So, but that's um, that's a different threat actor. So, so you've got the criminals, which will basically get into a network, figure out how to, um, you know, if there's fungible assets or somehow to mm -hmm. monetize it one way or another. Ransomware has become so effective now. Like, there's even firms, and this makes me, you know, makes me sick to my stomach that will, mm -hmm. their whole business is to help broker uh, and negotiate oh, the ransom and figure out Bitcoin for the customer that's never dealt with Bitcoin. I just before. had that conversation again with the insurance guy because yeah. essentially it's like, you know, we do everything we can to see if we can not pay these guys. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, you're in some situations where the company's got no choice. Mm -hmm. Like, and all you got to do is hope that they're going to release the keys. Yeah. And, you know, there's luckily some, they, they can do some investigation to see what the probability of that is. But, you know, just, isn't, you know, we'll go back to it. There's an old saying in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when you ask the instructor and you say, um, you know, how do I get out of this move? And if they don't know the answer, the classic answer is simple don't put yourself in that position. Exactly. Right? Like, it's uh, defense is the first line of <laughs> offense in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. So you've got uh, the criminals and there's a range, uh, there's organized crime as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, hackers are celebrated in other parts of the world. Like in Russia, there's a oh, magazine God. called Hacker where, really? you know, it's, uh. Um, it's scantily clad women on the front of yachts with Lambos and, um, you know, they celebrate their success. Um, so it's at that kind of scale. You've got uh, hacktivists, which they do not believe in what you're doing, so they, they want to disrupt your business yeah. uh, on moral grounds. Oil, gas. And, and then you've um, got nation states. Yeah, nation yeah. states. Then you got nation states. The nation states have traditionally, with few exceptions, I'll go through a couple of those, they're, they're mostly gathering intel. And yeah. they're low, slow, go in, take the stuff, or observe continuously, and get out. They don't have any intention on, on disruption. Now, Well, that happens on occasion. Let's right. not forget the entire range. And nuclear uh, nuclear well, fiasco. That was uh, you know um, that was Stuxnet, and then the Saudi Aramco had their systems yep. wiped out. That was attributed to the Iranians. The uh, Lazarus Group, which is attributed to North Koreans, we did hand to hand combat with them. Are uh, the ones that took out the Sony network over that movie, yep. and then which um, wasn't a great movie anyway. But. Yeah, but you know. <laughs> I thought it was funny tongue in cheek. I, I liked it, yeah. but I thought like this is what you got so worked up about. Yeah. But you know, that was extremely destructive. But, but those are a few of the very rare exceptions. And there was the Ukrainian uh, power grid, a good chunk yeah, of it got taken out by the Russians, Russians during yeah. the Crimea crisis. There's a dam in Westchester, New York that the Iranians are purported to have uh, broken into. It was just a tiny little water control dam of 10 feet of water behind yeah, it. But they were testing yeah, the, the... They were testing their trade testing, craft. Yeah. Yeah. But besides that, and I'm, we're probably talking like decimal something percent of uh, of all of the nation state attacks. All the other ones are information gathering yeah. and planting uh, latent capabilities for future use. So their whole job is to stay cloaked and... Uh, so we you know we don't know how extensive it is the the interesting thing is the mid market is uh, has been easy to get into for a long time so assume that there's beachheads in there and it's true in larger enterprises but uh, it's mm -hmm. going to be far less true in larger enterprises yeah i mean it's it's how much of this is systems how much is this people at this point i mean you're seeing you're seeing attacks i mean you generally deal with attacks that are inbound right how much of this is yeah. actually being perpetrated just through to the weakest link is typically the staff, right? Well, like, there's two two parts to that answer. One is, you know, the white collar crime insider uh, uh, threat is still probably.
probably the most prevalent, most costly. That we don't generally deal with that. That's a, that's a tougher. That's large organizations have internal investigators uh, and so forth yeah. for that. But um, and we're mostly dealing with with external actors. So there's that category of internal threat. But really, if you look at our traffic, uh, ninety. 95% range, high confidence is self-inflicted wounds. Humans have actually triggered, they have invited, yeah. and we've got hard data on this, uh, they have invited the adversary in by either you know clicking on a link in an email, opening an attached document, opening attached document from a trusted party. And this is where um, we mm. should come back and talk a bit about supply chain, but we're in a trusted business relationship. You send me a document, you don't know there's got a payload inside of it, and I open it, then I get compromised. Uh, so that is, so it's self-inflicted wounds and I like to describe what we do is we lie in the weeds and we uh, keep the customer safe from themselves at that point in time when they click on that link and so uh, when they click on the link they are going externally for internally to externally through their firewall and inviting that payload to come into their the machine. So basically the adversaries have, you know, sure they can brute force firewalls, but if your firewall is configured properly, they're not gonna have any success. Mm -hmm. They're not all configured properly, that's why it still mm -hmm. happens. The so-called pen test, which is, you know, a bit of pretend uh, when you're, you know, blasting away at a firewall, like any given business has got between 200 to 500 knocks at the door every single hour on their firewall. And none of those things are worth responding to because your firewall is set up properly. Properly. Mm -hmm. Those things don't matter. It's when somebody invites you in mm -hmm. and you come in with full permission. Oh, yeah, come on in. Doors wide open. Have yeah, a seat over yeah. here. And that is what's happening. So um, unless you, you create telemetry to be able to detect that, then they're going to come in all day long. You gave us a glimpse of some, uh, behind the curtain of uh, cyber warfare, my friend. Well done. Uh, it's um, <laughs> the numbers and scale are staggering. So before we wrap up, there's three questions I ask everybody. If you had one wish for something you could change in your industry or your company as a whole, what would it be? Well, you know, there's a self-serving element of this. Regulations to compel people to do what they should do makes me crazy. And worse than that, where you have people... Um, advocating for the government to pay firms to do what a normal business person should do anyways. So that part, it's all upside down. So it's what we have is we have a challenge in that the entire industry, can I say sucks uh, in this uh, thing? You can. Okay. They suck at being able to convert cybersecurity risk into terms that boards of directors and executives understand. This is a business risk. It's the same as you know health and safety, environmental, foreign exchange, all the risks that everybody knows how to deal with. And we show up with our propeller caps and we talk zeros and ones and packet capture and deep inspection and all this stuff. And that makes me crazy yeah. because because it's kind of like jargon. these people yep. aren't smart enough to understand. Well, actually, we're not smart enough to, to translate it into terms to understand. Yeah. So that's where I want to see. That is one wish is to have the conversation in business terms. It's a risk. It needs to be uh, mitigated with things that you can do easily in-house, uh, bring in extra help to you know reduce it more, transfer a little bit with insurance because most of doesn't transfer mm -hmm. and then you know self-insure uh, the residual and that that is how business runs and all the other risks so why can't we do that in cybersecurity? i mean honestly though how many weeks go by without a major hack being announced at these days like it's it, 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 we, i'm being facetious with weeks how many days go by uh, right it's daily it's daily right it's daily and and the scale of them i mean some of them you know not all of them are as stupid as the entire equifax admin username and admin password which by the way just how is that guy not in jail um <laughs> that was well that, that was, was um you know the cso uh who, chief scapegoat officer <laughs> that's who had that's a background a, in yeah. music or that's english was it yeah, yeah. Well, actually, nobody has anyone with gray hair can't have a background in, in security from a university because it didn't exist. It yeah. didn't exist. Those programs are just coming to, to bear now. Oh, boy. Yeah. But I mean, it's, you know, if I'm if I'm a company that has to deal with all those things, forget, you know, talk about business risk. This yeah. to me has to be the number one business risk. I mean, you have, you know, again, the enemy who could basically a cripple your operations, b steal your data and destroy your reputation, c basically steal your money. Like, I mean, like whatever they, once they're in your systems, what is it they can't do? Like that, it's the same thing as literally opening up the door and saying, hey, criminals, come in and do whatever the heck you want. And yeah. by the way, my staff's just gonna kind of move aside from the keyboards while you do it. Yeah. Like it's, it's that's that's the level we have to look at it as. Well, and, and you know, being FinTech focused, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you think of, there's not much that we do now that isn't got some electronic communication with a counterparty and a trusting or an implied trusting relationship. Like exactly. if you're, you know, I see you've got an iPhone phone there, um, there's implicit trust when you go to that 
that that app because there's the uh, you know the walled garden uh, exactly. Apple model, but that there's implicit trust, and you're you're giving you're surrendering immediately something that could compromise. But our economy is running at that speed, so yep. so you got to weigh these two. It really is. It's a difficult conversation. Uh, well, it's a difficult. I mean, it's everything's trade offs when it comes to security. So, second point: What's the biggest challenge you faced in getting the company to where it is today? The biggest challenge uh, has always been recruiting the talent that we need, because as a service provider, different than a software publisher. Um, as every time we add X number of customers, we have to add threat analysts. And our ratios are fairly low, like you know, five to one in, in our, you know, in the managed Good. world. They can go I mean, up. how many of these things can they how many companies can they truly understand inside yeah. and out? Yeah, we've seen ratios as high as hundred to one. So we So basically they have no idea what's right. really going on in the company. So, so exactly. And so our challenge had been and, and it remains today, uh, is access to talent and, and we've actually integrated ourselves so deeply into the the ecosystem here. Uh, six colleges, three universities we're on boards, we're uh, uh, giving lectures, we're helping with the syllabus, we have a, our whole internal training program. So we actually are bringing uh, folks in from, you know, out of uh, college with a three or four year uh, technology network uh, with a bit of cyber, and we have to upskill them to be able to take our, our load. And then have them, you know, peer uh, uh, watched for some period of time, and, and then they're they're capable to, to run. Yeah. Yep. So that has been, and that will remain the industry's biggest challenge, because no matter how good the AI gets the bad guys have AI too they have cloud storage they have they have all of the things that we have without any of the friction of you know the rules of business or regulations, <laughs> regulations right? or so, ethics yeah, yeah. exactly we can't do that there's no such thing as we can't yeah. do I that. often say well they are morally corrupt they're phenomenally gifted and you can never underestimate the adversary so what the sort of essence of managed detection and response is using all these technologies to detect but then having a human doing sort of the last mile of you know gray matter uh, correlation uh, there's just patterns that that need to be uh, observed and acted on that are way beyond any machine to discover Absolutely. today. Absolutely. And it's, uh, what was that line? I think it was from Doctor Who of all places. The problem with good men is they have too many rules, right? It's, uh, they're restricted, right? So last question is, what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and gets you up in the morning to keep doing what it is you're doing? Other than the fact knowing that there's imminent threats everywhere, apparently. <laughs> This is going to sound a little crazy, but I, you know, I did have ADD before I started in this industry. And I don't think I could work in another one because there's <laughs> constantly new stimulus. And you you see the creativity of what the bad guys are up to. And then we have, you know, we always think in terms of seconds, hours, uh, days to come up with uh, detection and mitigation and so forth. And it's constantly a challenge. There is never a dull moment. And it's it's not like I, you know, I need the adrenaline rush, although I drive race cars. You know, maybe there's a correlation in there. <laughs> <laughs> Extreme ski. Uh, anyways, you know, uh, it, it is it is the sort of thing that once you're in it, it is it's probably hard to leave, if not impossible. Again, I, I do. <laughs> the constant stimulus, the constant rush. I'm sure there must be times where you even just sit back and look at the attack and be like, wow, that was masterfully engineered. I mean, trying to quash and, and defeat the limits of human human and soon to be computer. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, imagination. almost. Yeah. Like it's 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 got to be quite the challenge. Well. I'm glad guys like you are on it, Jay. <laughs> well, we're, we're doing our part. Um, yeah, you know, we, we also, I tell my staff, we do town halls, I said, you know, just think in terms of the six trillion of AUM that we're securing, there's some percentage of your RSP or 401k that the That's pension it. fund has allocated into that strategy. And every time there's a loss, then that's a slightly lower return. And, you know, it's going to be a death by a thousand cuts. So, it. so it's our job to protect our own stuff. Absolutely. Once again, thank you for what it is you do and thank you for the time. This has been greatly informative yeah. and a look behind the curtain of uh, of what we don't normally talk about on this side, but we do, we do touch on security, but this has been quite the uh, masterclass. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. So that was my interview with Jay Hayes. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you enjoyed the pulling back the veil of a side of the world that most of us don't get to see. <laughs> it was a little bit frightening, quite honestly. I'm glad guys like him are out there stopping the bad guys. And they are legitimately bad guys, crazy enough to say. So as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever to get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Jason Pereira. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.